but certainly not me. Um, we have uh, Team Richmond, who are working locally with the RVA Community Partners and supported by the Richmond Memorial Health Foundation. Um, Emma, Sam, and Ben have been working with the health team here um, on improving healthcare systems to better serve low-income residents. Um, Emma is going to come up and talk about their work. So as Nicole mentioned, our focus area in Richmond this year is healthcare services for people in poverty. One of Richmond's biggest challenges in this area is the number of uninsured residents. There's, uh, Virginia hasn't expanded Medicaid, so there's still a lot of people who fall in the gap between Medicaid coverage and subsidized private insurance plans under the Affordable Care Act. Richmond also has a growing number of uh, undocumented immigrants who aren't eligible for any of these government programs. Richmond does have a network of organizations that are doing really great work providing low-cost care to uninsured people. They include the City Health Department, uh, private primary care clinics, and programs at several of the major hospitals in the region. Uh, however, their resources are limited, so most of them have some sort of eligibility screening processes that patients have to go through in order to prove that they need discounted care from that organization. So here's what this might look like for one patient. This is Sherry. Uh, when she realizes that she needs to see a primary care doctor, she first has to take time off work, find childcare, and find a way to get to the office because she doesn't have a car. She also has to gather documents to prove her income. This could mean a few months of pay stubs, it could mean last year's tax returns, it could mean a letter from her employer saying what her pay is, but this is often pretty hard for people to get, especially if they are paid under the table, or maybe they work on odd jobs, they don't have a single employer. But once she does all of that and takes the bus to the clinic, there's a few things that could happen. First, the staff will check whether she brought all of the necessary information and documentation, and if she's forgotten anything, she'll probably have to come back another day. If she has all the right information, she still might not get screened that day because a limited number of screening appointments each day, often only a handful, and if there's none left that day, again, she'll have to take the bus back another day. But if she does get a screening appointment today, she'll wait in the waiting room to talk to one of the screening staff members. This can often take a couple hours. Eventually, she'll talk to one of the screening staff, and they'll help her through a paper application and see if she meets all the eligible. So hopefully Sherry gets to this point, where she's approved and now she can make an appointment to see a doctor. But a lot of people don't get to this point. Either they drop out of the process or they never start it in the first place. And if Sherry ends up needing care from some other organization, she's going to have to start this process from scratch all over again. So this process is often really slow and confusing. It takes a long time to get to the point where you can see a doctor. And a lot of people told us that they get frustrated by repeated steps, by unclear requirements, and by just not understanding why some people are accepted while others are denied. For a lot of people, it ends up being easier to just go to the emergency room. So there are two main goals we're focusing on moving forward. Our first goal is to decrease the amount of time it takes for a patient to get through this screening process and to see a doctor. Second, we're hoping that by making this process more organized and more transparent, we can increase patient trust in this health system. So here's what we're working on. Right now, all of the application processes are paper-based. So if a patient goes to a clinic and starts filling out an application, but then is missing some documentation, they have to come back another day to finish it. So we built an online profile with questions pulled from the existing paper forms at all these organizations. It lets users upload images of the patient's documents, such as pay stubs, and it asks about contact information, some basic demographic questions, and their uh, household size and income, which are used to calculate the income as a percentage of the federal poverty level, which is usually what's used for the eligibility cutoff. The patient might fill this out at home, at a clinic, or with the help of a social worker or a community health worker. 
Another problem right now is that if a patient needs health services for more than one of these organizations, they have to do the process completely separately at each one. But once this information is all online, with the patient's permission, an organization can easily share it with another one, so the patient doesn't have to start this process all over again when they need to go to another office. Another thing we heard a lot is that patients who might qualify for these services are reluctant to start the application process if they don't know whether they're going to qualify because it is so long. But at the same time, clinic staff told us that people will show up thinking that they'll qualify, they'll wait a few hours to talk to someone, then they'll find out that they really weren't even close to qualify. So we built a tool that lets people answer a few of the most basic eligibility questions about household size, income, and their current insurance, and gives them an estimate of what they're likely to be eligible for and how much they're likely to be asked to pay for different services. This isn't a definitive answer, but we're hoping it can help people figure out whether it's worth the time to fill out a complete application, which could be up to 100 questions in some cases. We're hoping that this will encourage people who are eligible to apply while also saving time for both patients and staff by discouraging applications for people who definitely won't qualify. All of this is also mobile friendly because the community health workers we're working with often go door to door in the public housing communities. And another group we're working with is interested in using a mobile version to help inmates sign up for these services before they're released from jail. So here's what an alternative process might look like for Sherry. She knows she needs to see a doctor, but she's not sure what she might qualify for. So she goes to talk to a community health worker, and together they use the pre-screening tool to figure out a clinic that might make sense. Once they find that clinic, a community health worker can help her fill out the complete application, and then send it on to the clinic without Sherry actually going into the office. The clinic can then review that information, and when Sherry gets to the clinic, she can go directly to seeing a doctor without having a separate appointment for screening. Once she sees a doctor there, if it turns out that she needs to be referred to some other organization, maybe to see a specialist, the clinic can send that information on without her having to start the process again. So in the past few weeks, we've made two trips back to Richmond, and we've shown our prototype application to community health workers like Shakita here, to social workers, to the uh, screening staff who are actually reviewing these applications figuring out who's eligible and to the leadership of these organizations. And their feedback's been really positive overall so far. We're working on responding to their first round of suggestions. And here are a few things we're discussing right now that we'd love to hear thoughts on. One is how to structure the HIPAA consent forms for the patients and the organization so that everyone's comfortable with information being shared but we're not adding more overhead than we need to. We're looking at the types of analytics that we could track that would be useful to the different stakeholders involved. Looking at how to avoid duplicate data entry situations where a staff member might have to enter a patient's information once into an electronic health record system and then again into our application. That will add a lot of extra work. And finally, testing with patients. We're looking for a few patients who are willing to try using our applications as they navigate the screening process. 